This is Lieutenant Colonel retired Francis Liberty, who served in the U.S. Army from 1943 to 1971. She was a surgical nurse serving during the times of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. This interview is taking place in East Greenbush, New York on July 14, 2003 at 10 o'clock in the morning. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. Tell us your name and when and where you were born. My name is Frances Mary Liberty. I was born in Plattsburgh, New York, 14 September 1923. And what did you do before you entered the military? I was in nursing school. And which uh, nursing schools did you attend? Plattsburgh, New York, Champlain Valley Hospital School of Nursing. It no longer exists. Uh huh. Now why did you go into the Army? Because there was a war on and I thought it would be a big adventure. And can you tell us a little bit about the day you registered, where you registered for the Army, and what basic training was like? I registered in Waterville, New York. Um, I was 20 years old at the time. Uh, in New York State, you're not allowed to take your boards, your nursing registration boards, until you're 21. But at the time of the war, Mr. Roosevelt needed nurses so badly, he let us take them early. And those of us that wanted to went in the military, those that did, didn't go. And... Um, Basic training was difficult. Now, most people don't realize it, but nurses aren't used to that sort of thing. Like, oh, we went on hikes, we pitched tents, we ate out of rations, we um, kept our room, our bed clean. We there were twenty women in one dorm or barracks. And open showers, which was difficult for me, and uh, we <laughs> ate in a mess hall, but we were used to eating in, in dining rooms, you know. That wasn't too bad, but, and the food was very good. And uh, that was rough. Basic training was very hard on this day. We had to... Uh, climb that fence, that big board. We had to swing off the rope in mud. We we learned how to crawl on our bellies under barbed wire with our fannies down and that ain't easy for a woman. And that's about it. Then we, I went to, uh, I was one of the ones that was sent to Fort Patrick Henry in Virginia and I went overseas. And where did you go on your first assignment overseas? Well, as we when you go up the gangplank, you give your name, your rank, and your serial number. And now you've got 60 pounds of medical supplies on your back, and you're carrying your duffel bag with your personal things in it. So you, and you got fatigues on, or, or not fatigues, they were slacks and shirts at that time, because they still didn't have us dressed properly. So we walked up the gangplank and I said, Liberty Francis M. N799517. And he looked at me and he said, Oh my God, you're a woman. I said, last time I checked, I was. They had spelled my first name wrong with an I instead of an E. So he said, Well, you'll have to stand over here, ma'am. So I went over there and then pretty soon, maybe half an hour later, another girl comes up the gangplank and her name is Marion. And they had her classified as a man, too. So she and I stood there, and they, there are four people, four bunks in a stateroom. With a, you know, an alleyway, a whole, you know, passage between the bunks. And there was one up, and so they slung hammocks between them for us, her, her and I. She in one room and I in the other. There were five people in that stateroom. Four of them were seasick, and I wasn't one of them. So the first night, I got out and sat, slept in the hall, or the gangway, and 
she did the same thing. And then the next night, she and I were together, and we thought, well, we go up on deck. You know, at least the air was better. So we got up on deck, and the sailors, you have to be very quiet. Don't say anything. You know, don't move even. So we got in behind a gun emplacement. We were in convoy. And uh, we slept there cold. The Atlantic in October, it was really cold. So the next night when we went up, there were blankets and pillows there for us. We landed in England, and I was separated from the group. <clears throat> there was a Texas outfit that needed a surgical nurse. And because of my nurse's training, my education, and my, I was selected to go with that group. Now, I was the only Yankee in the crowd, and that's when I learned there was Yankees and then there were Southerners. And we went from there to Africa, and from Africa we went over to Anzio. We were in Anzio ahead of the information that they received. There was more resistance than they expected. We were supposed to be the third wave, but we were still, it was still the first when we landed there. And this <laughs> big Texan says to our chief nurse, who was a, a little, maybe she was five feet tall, but she wore cowboy boots. And she had um, red hair and a thick, thick braid down her back, which she put up under her helmet. And um, <laughs> he says to her, oh my God, you're women. You're not supposed to be here. She said, we're here. He said, well, you're not supposed to be here. She said, we're here and deal with it. So I don't think she came up to his chest. She was so small. So we lived in foxholes with the fellas. Not, not with the fellas. We lived in foxholes that they dug out for us. And we used a bigger foxhole for our little hospital until we could get help. But the, nobody died on us. They didn't dare. A <laughs> uh, little, little question. Was there your basic training? Where did it take place? Four and was dicks. there an unusual, any unusual person that you can remember from that time that had a lasting impression on you? I had a drill sergeant who um, gave me a bag of rag, rocks to hang in my left hand so I'd know which foot to step off on. And uh, I used, later saw him in Korea coming back from uh, one of the mass units. I was on the hospital trains and I uh, turned this man over to, so I could look at his wound, and he said to me, I suppose you're going to, you remember me? And I said, yes. He said, I suppose you're going to let me bleed to death. I said, I'd thought about that. <laughs> but that would be a black mark on my record. <laughs> now, when you were in Africa, what kind of uh, wounds did you see in general? We saw very little. Uh -huh. We were just there waiting to step off. Now, where was Anzio? What country? Italy. And from there? We went up the road, up the boot, for Rome. And along the way, we stopped off and filled, uh, you know, refilled first aid stations and stuff. And being women, we had to go to the bathroom regularly. And uh, we wore slacks. Now, we didn't have any problems in most of the places, but we got to this one place, and um, I don't know if they'll let you keep this in the tape, and um, it was a slit trench. Now, that's difficult for women with slacks on. You know that. <laughs> so we went out and we said to our chief, that's a slit trench. We can't use that. So she went and found the officer in charge, and she said to him, something has to be done. These are slit trenches and my ladies can't use them. He said to her, it's, they're sufficient. Tell them to use them. She said, 
Sir, my ladies are setters, not pointers. <laughs> Fix it. So they did something. We, and then we set up in Rome. Uh, we had one of Mussolini's palaces. And we used one of his bathtubs as a Hubbard tank for the fellow's legs. And uh, it was absolutely beautiful, all black and white marble. Didn't make for a good hospital, but it was nice. And uh, all the rooms were what had apparently been guest rooms. There must have been, there was a lot of them, and they were big. And we used to walk to St. Peter's to Mass any time we felt like it. And, you know, you could go there any time during the day or night and there was a Mass going on. Now, was there any special military precautions put in place around the, the Vatican area? Was it free for anybody to go back and forth? Anybody could go back and forth. The Pope did not come out. The Pope came out, I think, in 1945 for the first time after the war. And that was one of the most beautiful sights you'd ever want to see. He came out on a litter being carried by the Swiss Guard. And he wore a diamond this big right here. And now the crazy Americans are out there. And it's raining. And there's mud all over. Now the Americans, when he approached them, knelt. The Italians stood up screaming, Viva la Papa! There's a doctor next to me and he pokes me, and of course the Americans are crying. Pokes me and he said, I don't know what the hell I'm crying for. I'm a Jew. <laughs> <laughs> but he, even many years later, he remembered that. He said it was one of the, the most awe-inspiring things that he's ever seen. On your way to Rome, what kind of... Uh Housing, did you slept out in the field? Did you have shower facilities? No, or? no. We didn't have shower facilities and unless they were presented to for us at the places that we stopped at. And we slept mostly in our vehicles. We had uh, ambulances and we slept in those. And when? When did you first uh, start seeing uh, a greater number of casualties for treatment? All along the way. And in Antio we saw a lot of them. But all along the way we saw a lot of casualties. And we did what later on in MASH was described as meatball surgery. We patched them up as best we could. Now people heard of MASH because of the t popular television show Conditions certainly were nothing like that, but could you tell us what MASH stood for and also what it was like operating as a unit inside one of the, that facility? They did not have MASH units in World War II. Those had been thought of, but hadn't been actuated until Korea. Uh, MASH, unit, MASH is a very amusing show. Uh, all of those things did not happen in one unit. They happened, I won't say they didn't happen. And a lot of stuff that happened they could never put on television. But it happened in all of the mass units. Some little thing happened, you know, and they put it all together in one story. Uh, Korea was difficult. That's the most, that's the coldest I've ever been in my life and the dirtiest, and the smelliest, and the wounds were vicious, and the kids were young for the most part. Uh, now, in World War II, they were contemporaries of mine. Uh, in, World War, in Korea, they were contemporaries, most of them, and uh, a lot of the people that I worked with were what we, we would call retreads. I was called back in, and so was a lot of others. Um, but in Vietnam, they were babies. I was older, and they were younger. That bothered me more than anything. 
Now, after being in Rome, what did you do? Where did you go from there? What kind of experiences can you tell us about? I came home from Rome and got out of the service. And I worked at the Leonard Hospital in Troy, which is now defunct, until I was called back for Korea. Now, my father was a patient in the hospital with a heart condition. And uh, I come from a large family. There was uh, six girls and three boys. Um, one boy died very young. And when I got the orders, I was the only one at home when my father, when I got called back in. My father, my mother had been dead for a number of years. My father had remarried. And I had two stepsisters who were young adults. And uh, when uh, I got called back in, I didn't want to leave him because he was a cardiac. But they told me I had to go because I had other sisters in the area. So when I went in to tell him I had to leave, now my father was not a flag waver. He didn't want me in the service to begin with. So when I went in and told him, he said to me, my girl, I'm very proud of you. You have a talent and a, a career that can aid your country when she needs you. That was not my father. So I looked at him and he said to me, and I mean that, I've always been proud of you. I just didn't want you to know it. Now, this is not about the military, but he had to have blood drawn and he was very difficult to have blood drawn in the hospital. So I was the supervisor. I was the youngest nurse on duty, the supervisor, because of my experience in the Army. So this one nurse came to me and she said, Lib, the lab's tried, I've tried, and there was a girl that worked on OBGYN who had to draw lots of blood. She's tried, we can't get in. So I said, okay, I'll do it. So I went in and I stood outside the door and I said, Please, blessed mother, let me get into this vein. I went in, put the tourniquet on, and he said, huh, you're going to try? Everybody else goofed. I got right in. Ah, dumb luck. <laughs> so a couple days later, I'm in the, the bathroom off his room, and my brother was there visiting him, and my, he says to my brother, don't tell her I said this, but she's good. She could get in when nobody else could. Don't let her know. <laughs> I think that was typical of uh, parents back yeah. then, mm -hmm. too, yeah. Now, uh, from your recall in the service, did you have to go through any kind of training, retraining? No. no. I went to Fort Dix, and I was issued uniforms. And then I... I went to McGuire, an air base next door to Fort Dix, and I went to Korea. Went to Africa, to, to Japan first. I landed in Yokohama, and went from Yokohama to Tokyo, and then got assigned to Osaka. I was in Osaka about three months, and I went to Korea. In those days, they didn't give you a rhyme or reason. They just sent you. And I never thought of objecting to an assignment because I thought that's where they needed you, you know? So I kept getting sent back to Fort Dix. So I was in the chief nurse's office in Washington one day, and I said to this friend of mine, how come they keep sending me to Fort Dix? You know what their answer was? You don't complain. I thought that was the craziest answer. I said, you're kidding. She said, no, Lib. Nobody wants to go to Fort Dix. <laughs> I knew everybody in the area. I knew the quartermaster. I, I knew the guy at the liquor store. <laughs> I knew them all. And it didn't bother me. 
Now, when you were over in Korea, how soon was it before you got into real serious use of your medical and nursing skills? Maybe three days. And what was it like? It was shocking. Um, I was at a hospital in Seoul for about three days, and then uh, one of the nurses that worked the trains got sick. So they picked me, which was, to my, my opinion, lucky. I enjoyed it. Uh, you uh, usually went up north, empty, or maybe you'd have a general or a couple of nurses that were going to different stations or some corpsmen or some men that were being transported but nobody sick. Coming back you were loaded with patients. You picked them up as long as you came. You went up as far north as you could go. Then you came down slowly and picked up patients. And uh, you left some of the patients off on, and I'm trying to remember that seaport, that port where we left off nurse patients on the hospital ships. The Good Hope. Busan? No. No. It was Tegu. Tegu. Yeah, Tegu. And then uh, that was lovely because uh, that's when you got a shower and clean clothes. Um, the Navy nurses had showers and they wore these uh, gray jumpsuits that zipped up the front that were the most comfortable things in the world. And um, I always carried clean underwear with me. So when we got there, I would take a shower and they would give me one of their jumpsuits. And um, they were so, nobody ever said anything or objected. And then we had the chief nurse of the Army Nurse Corps. And I've forgotten what her name was. But she said to me, which army do you belong to, young lady? And I looked right at her and I said, the one that's got the clean clothes. She said, hmm, and walked away. So somebody said to me, you're in trouble. I said, what else is new? You know? So I told her the truth. It, I, they were clean clothes. So when we got down to Pusan, to Seoul, to Seoul, the chief nurse there was a friend of mine. And she said to me, what did you do now? And I said, why? She said, well, they're going to take you off the trains. I said, that's okay. She said, they're going to send you up to one of the mass units. I said, it's okay with me, too. But they didn't. The doctor that was in charge of the trains told her flat out, no way are you taking her. Because when she comes down, all of her patients are alive. They didn't dare die. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of paperwork. Mm -hmm. Now, did you treat uh, casualties from other countries? We had quite a few Allied forces over there. Was there any special we had treatment Swedes. for them? We had Swedes. We treated them the same as we did the others, our own. There were Swedes. There were... Um, Danes, they were Filipinos. Australians. English, English and Australians, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you find the men were happy to see a woman when they were injured? Uh, oh yes, oh yeah, yeah. And I at that time had long, long hair that I used to keep braided and keep. Under the helmets we had a, like a little baseball cap, a knit baseball cap that fit right over, and then I would put my braids up under that, and then the helmet on, because those helmets are hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they're really not nice things. And uh, one day I was working on this kid, and we had taken our helmets off. We were in the <clears throat> triage area, and I had taken my helmet off and my cap because it was hot. And it was British. He said to me, ma'am, how long is your hair? I said, I'm not sure, but what a question to ask. He said, well, it's awful nice seeing a white woman. <laughs> so 
I said to him, okay, that's all right. So one of my braids fell and every down to my waist. And he said, oh, I bet your hair is pretty when you let it out. I said, get your mind off that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So then, uh, how long were you in Korea? 14 months, 16 months. Mm. And then, what happened after And I'll that? tell you something else about Korea. For 16 months, for twice a day, wherever I was, I ate peas. I don't eat peas at all. Now, I will not have a pea on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think of the corps men and corps women who were stationed over there? We didn't have any corps women, but we did have corps men. They were excellent. They really knew what to do, they knew how to do it, and they knew when to do it. And there wasn't anything that you could ask them to do that they couldn't do. If they didn't know how, they would tell you. They never faked it. Did you, on any occasion, treat civilian casualties, children? Yes, in, Korea, in Vietnam. Not Vietnam, Korea. We treated them in Vietnam, too, but in Korea. We treated um, kids that got sick. You know, they had uh, pneumonia and stuff like that. And uh, we had antibiotics. And we had a couple of bad deliveries. Actually, we didn't have the equipment to take care of that, but you'd be surprised at what doctors can do. Mm -hmm. And will do. Now, the quality of the equipment, uh, how would you rate it uh, from Korea versus what you had to use in the World War II theaters? Better. In what way? Well, World War II had taught them they needed different equipment. They needed new things, you know. They needed um, to upgrade, move with the times. And there had been so many inventions or discoveries that were the result of World War II. Like they're starting to use um, surgical glue now on wounds. We were experimenting with that in Korea. Instead of sewing, they glued them together. And uh, just like the space program is uh, helping them now in their surgical units, uh, World War II helped. So did Korea for Vietnam. Uh, one of the first uh, vein transplants wasn't done in Korea from a cadaver. Uh, you know, you didn't have to go through all that fuss of getting permission and stuff like that. It was just done. Uh, maybe not legal, but it saved a kid's life and saved a kid's leg. And a lot of doctors will do anything to save a limb. They do not like to cut them off. Can you recall seeing the same patient more than once um, very in, throughout your tour in Korea? Yes. He was a young sergeant from, <laughs> I can see him now. He had blonde hair. And he was from Georgia, Macon, Georgia. And each time he came in and he was wounded, he was mad as hell. Because he felt he'd been stupid to stick his neck out that way. And both times, one time it was a shoulder wound, and the next time it was a thigh wound. And he really did get mad because he didn't get sent home. He got patched up and sent back. And he said to me, what do I have to do, get my head or my arm taken off? And I said, oh, God, don't even say that. And if you do, tell them you don't want to come to this hospital. 
Have you? Uh, do you have any idea where he is today? No, or how no. He's doing? Now promotions. How did you have to uh, do some any kind of testing, studying? How did they accomplish giving a promotion? I have no idea. It was a complete surprise. Then. Always a complete surprise to me, because I had such a big mouth. You know, if it was. As far as I'm concerned, in medicine, there is no shade of gray. It's all black or white. And I said it that way. And I had a theory for all of my tours that those patients, those men, were out on the line doing the best they could for their country. And by damn, they were going to get the best care money could buy, or I was going to know the reason why. And they did. And I saw to it, anybody that came to my unit got the best care money could buy. Sometimes better than money could buy because they got it with compassion. Can you remember what kind of salaries you had? Uh, and you probably had no opportunity to uh, purchase any luxuries while you were stationed overseas. We had the Sears catalog. You could buy anything with that. And uh, our salaries were compatible. After World War II, our salaries were more than compatible with civilian nursing. Now, I retired at Fort Gate in 1971. My pension covers me completely now. It did then. But I know nurses that were couldn't retire until they were in their 60s. And they didn't retire with what I have. So the salary has to be good. The pension is good. And plus we get um, oh, now that I'm on Medicare, we get uh, supplemental insurance from the military. And all we have to do is pay, uh, for our prescriptions, all we do is pay three dollars $3 for a generic drug and nine dollars for a name drug. That's the TRICARE for Life program. TRICARE for Life, yeah. That's a very good program. Mm -hmm. And we don't pay anything for it. Well, you did at one time have the promise that you would have medical care for the rest of your life. And then that was taken away in the 1950s. And it wasn't only until approximately two years ago that those benefits were restored. Yeah, well, we had Champus there for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So How long were you... you oh, excuse me. I was going to say, now when you left Korea, what did you do? Did you stay in the military? Oh, yeah, I stayed in the military. Uh, <clears throat> I traveled around. I was at Fort Dix. I was in uh, Georgia. I was in San Francisco, Fort Sam Houston, Texas. When I was at Fort Sam Houston, Texas, I went, when, when, when I was at Fort Dix for a while, I used to go to New York with a bunch of the other late nurses and go to Columbia University. I got my bachelor's degree there. But then when I was at Fort Sam, I started at Incarnate Word. And you did this on your off-duty time. And I paid for my own education because I had seen nurses get their education from the military. And then they had to do what they told them to do. I mean, you had to do what they, but I didn't feel that I was a teacher. And a lot of the girls that got their advanced degrees were made to teach. Uh, I'm too rigid to be a teacher, or was, still am. Um, One of the, uh, I was at Carnet Word, and then I went to Walter Reed. And I got, I was a, I went to a Catholic University and finished my master's. Uh, when I finished my master's, they sent for me to go to the chief nurse's office. And the only reason they knew I was getting my master's is because I had to ask for the day off to go to the graduation ceremony. And it hit the papers that an army captain had graduated third in the class. 
So she sent for me and she said, You're, we want you to go to the research building to work. I said, I've been over there. I did my stint over there and I don't want to go back. I don't feel that working with pigs and apes is my style. She said, we educated you, you'll do as you're told. I said, you didn't educate me. I did it myself and I'm not going there. I'll get out first. She said, you will never be promoted. A captain. So when I got my, I was at Fort Monmouth when I got my lieutenant colonelcy, I sent her a telegram. She was retired down in Florida. And I knew where she was because she lived with a lot of other nurses that I knew, you know, in a, in a like a little village. And I said, for some, he's not going to be promoted to above the rank of captain. I'm not doing bad, am I? <laughs> and I signed it. Francis M. Liberty, Lieutenant Colonel ANC. A couple of days later, commanding officer calls me in. I went in and secretary says to me, what'd you do? I said, <laughs> I don't know. She said, he got a phone call. And apparently you upset somebody's apple cart terribly. So I went in and reported to him and he said, say, why the hell did you send that telegram? I said, I had to. Why? I said, I just wanted, I thought she should know. He said, did you do it when you were a major? And I said, no. He said, why now? I said, I just thought she should know. He said, well, she's really mad. I said, because I've been promoted? He said, no, because you had the audacity to send her a telegram. Then the chief nurse of uh, First Army, who was stationed at Governor, Governor's Island. She came to visit me. She says to me, why did you do that? Her name was Nora Driscoll. Why did you do that? I said, because I wanted to. She said, well, she thinks you're a brat. I said, I am. But she really got upset. Ah. Oh, good for you. Now, how long was it, and what was it like when you received orders to go to duty in Vietnam? Well, I knew I was going. I, you know, you, you know you're going to be tapped. And I will confess to you, I didn't want to go. But I didn't object. So I went... forgotten how I went. Oh. We went to uh, San Francisco. Yeah. We shipped out of Oakland. Flew. We flew to Alaska, then over. And uh, it wasn't bad. I landed in uh, <laughs> Tonsonet Air Base. And uh, during the flight, I was the only female aboard. During the flight, next to me was a young Navy f pilot. I think he was a captain, young captain. And he was really excited about getting on a destroyer, on an aircraft carrier. And uh, we chit-chatted. When we got off the plane, now we traveled. Now why they sent us in this outfit to a place like Vietnam, I'll never know. But they, we had to travel in a skirt and a blouse, you know, and shoes and pantyhose. We got off the plane. Just as we stepped onto the tarmac, they screamed, get down, get down, we're under attack. So you lay down on the tarmac, right? And this Navy pilot says to me, oh my God, I'm going to get killed on the ground without being in the air. And all I could think of was, I'm going to die with a run in my stockings. <laughs> now they sent us to Longbin. 
And from Longbin, they issued us fatigues and all that stuff, and they gave you your duty assignment. Well, they assigned me to Saigon. I had to go back to Saigon. And they sent in uh, deuce and a half. You know what a deuce and a half is, with benches along the side. There were three civilian women, me, and about five GIs. Let me see here. Six, four, there were 12. There must have been eight GIs. And along the road, we got under attack, and we had to get out of the truck and get into the ditch. These two women wouldn't get down into the ditch. They didn't want to get dirty. And this one says to the sergeant, I'm General Abrams' secretary. You're going to be in big trouble if you don't stop talking to me like that. So I stood up and I figured, what the hell can they do to me? I said, get down in the ditch. She looked at me and she said, did you hear who I am? And I said, I don't care who you are. I know that you're endangering a lot of people. Now get down in the ditch before I throw you in the ditch. I want your full name. I said, get down in that ditch. She got down in the ditch. So after everything was over, I said to the sergeant, you have a piece of paper and a pencil? He said, yes. And I wrote down my name, my rank, my serial number. And I handed it to her and I said, here. I don't want anybody else to get credit for this. You be sure and you give the general my name. And then when you do, you tell him, Lib said hi. <laughs> so we got back and we got into Saigon. And this sergeant says to me, Colonel, she's really going to report you, you know. I said, I hope she does. Because I like to tell the general what she, what she is. So a bit of I says, the hospital in Saigon was gorgeous. It had at one time been a school for all the European and American diplomats' children. It's all white marble. Absolutely gorgeous place. Well kept. Well, you know, beautiful hospital. Had all the equipment that you could imagine in. Had a a very nice triage area where the patients would come in. Beautiful ORs. It was a beautiful, well-kept place. And I don't know how they set it up so fast, but it was had all the stuff you could want in it. So about three days later, the commanding officer calls me into his office, and he said to me, General Abrams wants to talk to you. I said, where is he? He said, He's coming along this afternoon, but he wants to make sure you're ready for him. I said, oh, I'm ready. He said, what's the matter? I said, I told his secretary to get down in the ditch before I threw her down. He said, what did I told him about it? He said, huh, I don't know. I don't understand. What? Maybe he's going to go to congratulate you for saving your life. I said, I, said, I doubt it. <laughs> he came along. I reported to him, saluted him and all that jazz, and he said to me, are you the young lady that ordered, and he gave her name, down in the ditch, and I said, yes, I am. He said, uh, you want to tell me why? I said, she was endangering the lives of eight men and myself. That's why. He said, could you tell me the circumstances? And I said, certainly. I said, I hope you don't think we all got out of that truck for exercise. I said, they were strafing us. And I said, the sergeant told everybody to get in the ditch, and we all did, except her. And she kept announcing to the world that she was your secretary. Now, to me, a civilian has no right to endanger the lives of the military. And I said to him, and another thing, General, I don't know why you want a secretary like that. She's not even that pretty. He 
didn't say any more. <laughs> okay, so then... Uh, so now you wonder why I was always surprised when I got promoted? <laughs> yes, I can see why. <laughs> but maybe they admire that forthrightness. And you what kinds of casualties did you see in Vietnam in the hospital? Awful. It's terrible. Um, a lot of big gaping wounds. A lot of wounds that, from landmines. A lot of head wounds. And then when you were done in Vietnam, um, you came back to the States? Yeah, and I went to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. I was chief nurse at Fort Belvoir. And then I retired. I realized I suddenly didn't want to go to work. And when a nurse doesn't want to go to work, it's time for her to folder tent. So I went in now, <clears throat> the sergeant major at Fort Belvoir, at the hospital at Fort Belvoir, he and I had the exact same birthday and year and everything. And I'd known Smitty since he was a first, uh, a, a private and I was a first lieutenant, second lieutenant. As a matter of fact, I was godmother to a couple of his kids. So I went in on the way in, I used to go in very early in the morning so I could see all of the critically ill, the real sick patients and the new admissions because I had to give a report to the commanding officer every morning. And I think when you're going to report about somebody that's that ill, you have to see them. You can't take somebody else's word for it. So I went in and I said, Smitty, start drawing up my papers. I'm going to retire. He looked up at me and he said, we're not old enough. I said, I am. I'm tired, Smitty. So I went on up to my office. And I gave the report. I got the report from this, from this night supervisor. Then I went around and visited my patients, came back to my office to drop a few notes off. The phone rang. And I picked it up, the secretary wasn't in, and I picked it up and I said, Colonel Liberty, can I help you? And this voice said, Libby, and it was a friend of mine that worked out of the chief nurse's office in Washington. She said to me, get out. They're going to send you back to Nam. And the last time I talked to you, you said you didn't have it anymore. I said, I don't. She said, get out. They're going to promote you and send you back said, not me. So she said, I'm in the parking garage on the payphone so nobody can trace this call. I said, okay. So I went down and as I'm coming down the hall, Smitty come out to meet me. And he said to me, I called Lucy and she said, we're old enough. I'm putting my papers in too. So he said, I'll have them ready for you to sign when you come out. So I gave the report. And the commanding officer and I were friends since he was a second, uh, an intern, and I was a first lieutenant. I knew his wife. He said to me, what's this about you retiring? You're not old enough, Liv. I said, oh, yes, I am, Bob. I'm tired. He retired. The three of us retired at the same time. We came out and I signed the papers and I said, Smitty, get these on the courier today. He said, why? I said, I have a bad feeling. Get them on the courier. My papers were signed and dated and timed before the other papers arrived. And I got out. They promised me the moon. But you know, you, you, after a while you learn, you can't trust them. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So, uh, what have you done since you've been out of the uh, military? Well, when I got, when I came home and I, I, after I decided to retire, I used to come home on weekends and look for a place to live. I didn't want to live with any of my sisters because my lifestyle was completely different than theirs. You know, I, and I couldn't find anything I'd live in. One apartment I almost rented, and as I'm standing there talking to the manager, I could hear a fight in the next ward, next room. I don't want that. So I came home, and I didn't know what I was going to do. One of my sisters called me, and she said to me, you come home this weekend. They are built something called condominiums in East Greenbush, and they're having an open house. These were the first condominiums in the area. So I came home. Two sisters and a niece came with me to look at it. They have townhouses and ranchers. I picked a rancher because I knew I was getting arthritic, and I didn't think I'd be able to make the stairs after too many years. This wasn't even built yet. They had models, but so I picked this one, put fifty dollars down. <laughs> That's thirty, thirty-two years ago. Mm. Did you experience uh, any hostility when you came back from Vietnam? How, what was the general uh, feeling of the country? Well, when I came back from Vietnam, um, I came out of <clears> the <throat> state of Washington, and I'm trying to remember the name of the airport there, but I can't. SeaTac? Uh, with Seattle? Seattle. I was in fatigues, and I carried my class B's with me, or class A's with me, to change. And I'm coming down the hall and I've got this garment bag over my arm and a small suitcase. Now I hadn't bathed, I've eaten sandwiches for two days, slept on a plane, I wasn't very happy. This woman walked up to me and called me a baby killer and hit me right in the mouth. Now, I only have one eye. I'm very careful about people coming near my face. She's lucky I didn't kill her. But before I could get to her, two security guards grabbed her. And they said to me, ma'am, we're sorry. We did no, not know you were on that plane. I was the only female on the plane. Or we would have been right there with you. We're sorry. So I said, I was still pretty shocked that somebody would hit me. So I went in and changed my clothes, and I, when I come out of there, there were two guards, and they put me on another plane to come home. And uh, I didn't. Ex I experienced some hostility uh, among the civilians when I moved here. The fact that I was an army nurse, I don't know what they thought I was, but they guarded their husbands carefully. And as I said to one other girl, I don't know what they're guarding, but I wouldn't have the best part of that. Now, looking back on your military career, if you were faced with doing it again, would you do it? Yes. And what would you do differently? In a heartbeat. Would there be any change in your attitude? No. Nope. In a heartbeat. As a matter of fact, um, when the Gulf War was, I had itchy feet. When they started the Gulf War, I, I almost felt like I should pack. But I wouldn't change my life. There's a few things I would have done differently, but those were personal things. But I wouldn't change my life for anything now. I have, I'm glad I was able to do all the things I did, 
travel the way I was. Um, I mean, I, I can't do those things now. And I'm glad I did everything I could. I enjoyed my life thoroughly. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. I hope you can use it. <laughs>